all of his bad Time of the birth of Imam Al Asqari his father, his father also died in a very early age, and uh, the age of Imam Al Taqi was 16 years. At the time of the birth of Imam Al Asqari his father was 16 years old, and Imam Al Nafi and Imam al Asqari are living in the times of some of the worst rulers in the history of the Abbas, including Mutawakkil and Mustansir bin Allah and Muhammad bin Allah. And uh, the situation. Uh, before I come to that, his Al-Qab, as I always mention, the Al-Qab of our 11th Imam are as zaki which means pure, having purity in the soul, and al askari which is the most famous one, and also Ibn Nudah, 
the son of Rida, that is a laqab which is shared between three imams in our history. Uh, Imam al-Jawad who was definitely the first and direct son of Imam Rida and after him Imam al-Naqi al-Hadi and after him Imam al-Hasan al-Asqari All three of them are called Ibn al-Raba. And uh, as a matter of fact, all the Sayyids whom we call Radhavi, uh, they are uh, actually from the lineage of Imam al-Taqi al-Jawad directly, not from the lineage of Imam al-Radha But they are called as Radhavi Sadaq because, uh, you know, that's the way it has been narrated. So, um, Ibn Rada is one of his alqab that, he, that is shared between three imams. And uh, the text of his ring was Subhana Mandahu Makalidu Samawatu Al Ard. That means glorified is the one who has the peace of heavens and earth with him. Or Ana Lillahi Shaheed. Which is not contradictory because it's always possible that uh, that Imam used to wear two rings instead of one. So I Ana Lillahi Shaheed means I am a witness for Allah. Just like Imam Rudali Salam and he used to recite. Surah al, al uh, you know, al mutaffifin uh, uh, sorry, Surah al teen was Zaytun. When Imam Rada alayhi salam used to recite Surah al teen was Zaytun, at the end of the surah he always used to say, Fu'ana ala dalika min al-shahideen. The end of the surah, the end of the surah, if you remember, is Alaysallahu bi ahkam al hakimin. Isn't Allah the best of the uh, of the judges? In other words, you know, this is what we learn in the light of the verse. So he used to say at the end of the surah that Bala wa ana ala dalika min al-shahidin. Yes, and I'm one of the witnesses over that. So, Ana Lillahi Shaheed. Every Imam is a Shaheed and a witness. And on behalf of Allah, not only over, uh, over the A'mal or the actions done by the people of his time, but also the A'mal and actions done by all the peoples of all times. And his mother, has several names mentioned in the narration. Khudais uh, and Salim are some of the famous ones. And has a lot of, uh, definitely, a lot of respect and highness in the hadith of Imam al Naqib al Hadi alayhi salam. He has said, about his wife that she has been taken out of every afat and aha and nijasat. So this is definitely the highness of that lady. And every uh, prophet based on our belief system and every imam uh, likewise based on our belief system has to have a father and a mother who are Tayyib and Tahir and Zaki and purified. You know, it's not possible according to our belief system that a prophet of God or a wasi of the prophet, uh, an Imam alayhi salam who are the wasi and awfiya of the prophet can be born to a father or mother who are not Tayyib or Tahir in their spirituality. That's not possible. Mm-hmm. 
لا يزال الله ينقلكم من أصلاب كل مطهر ومن أرحام المطهرات right? That's how we say in the ziyarat that constantly Allah has been transferring you and the bed from the sulb and the lineage of purified fathers and the rahm and womb of purified mothers. We don't believe like some other sects of Islam believe that Azar was the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Is it right? That's not what we believe. Azar was not his father. He was his uncle. The father of the Prophet can never be a mushrik. You know, shirk is definitely a very big sin. Not, he cannot be even uh, uh, somebody who has, who doesn't have the people qalb and people nafs and taharat of the qalb. So, uh, so Imam al-Asqari alayhi salatu wa salam had uh, definitely we have those du'as narrated for various sa'at of the day, if you remember. For every sa'at and every hour of the day we have a du'a. So likewise the du'a which is related to the 11th hour of the day relates to the 11th imam. And this is very uh, good if a uh, mu'min recite, recites those du'as and, and likewise every imam has his own tasbihat, his own specific muqtas tasbih that he used to recite and the tasbih of Imam al-Askari was uh, Subhana man huwa fi aluwihi danil that means glorified it is he who is uh, close in his highness wa fi dunuwihi alin and he is high in his closeness wa fi ishraqihi munir and he is uh, illuminating in his uh, ishraq, uh, giving nur in his illumination. Wafi sultani qawi, and he is strong in his governance. In, his, in other words, yeah. And subhanallah wa bihamdihi, glorified is Allah and with his praise. So this is the tasbih of Imam al-Asqari His Most of his life most of the life of Imam Askari al-Islam was in the prison or under the surveillance. So, most of the narrations or a lot of narrations about his life history are related to the life in the jail. First of all, there is very less information available about Imam al, uh, you know, Imam al, al jawad al-Islam and Imam Al-Nabi alayhi salam and Imam al-Asqar alayhi salam. We have very, very less information available. Uh, for very clear reasons, very obvious reasons, because these Imams have been uh, living a li life uh, forced by the lack of support from the community, lack of support of the people and the followers. They were forced to live a life in khifa. Our Imams have been either living a life in Shifa or a life which is, you know, not under shadow, but a life which is giving them exposure. So, starting from Imam Ali, salam, his personality got the exposure, is in the right? So, that was not in Shifa, it was in Alan. Then came the life of Imam Al Hassan, salam, which was in Shifa. Then Imam al his life was also in Khifa, except for the last segment of his life when he started the Qiyam, last four months approximately of his life where he got the exposure because of his Qiyam. And then Imam al-Sajjad again had a life in Khifa, never got the proper exposure that he deserved because of the lack of support from the community. Then Imam al-Baqir salam and Imam al-Sadiq al-Sadiqain alayhi salam both of them both of them got the exposure so and after that Imam al-Qadim alayhi salam his life was in Shifa as well in fact didn't get the exposure that he deserved because of the lack of support 
and uh, uh, and like and after him it was Imam Rida salam who got exposure only in the last three years of his life, twenty years of Imamat, but three years of the life spent in Khurasan, that's where he got the exposure. So but to some part, to some extent he got the exposure. Um, and so much that even the rest of the sects of Islam have been narrating from Imam Rabbi Salam. So he was not isolated in that sense. Uh, so, and then came the life of three monks. And all the three of them were in Shifa. Their life was in Shifa and in, under shadow, under a shadow and never got the proper exposure. The life history was very less narrated, less known, very, very few hadiths narrated from them. This is also a shame for the followers and the community, isn't it right? Because uh, people have been abandoning their imams. So this is definitely a shame for the followers and the community. So Imam Al-Askari Islam is the third one in the series of three Imams. It never happened in the history that three Imams got khifa, lack of, lack of exposure when the fell Imams, one after the other. So first time ever happened that three of the Imams, one after the other, were in the shadow. Shadow in the sense that people abandoned them and did not provide the proper support, so their life was never exposed except very, very less. So this is what our scholars say that Imam uh, Al-Hujjah ibn Hassan al-Mahdi alayhi salatu wa salam is, uh, is now a three Imam gap taking place between him and Imam al-Rabba alayhi salam. So he definitely is going to get the fullest exposure on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also the support from the people, isn't it right? Support from the people, he is going to get the finally, he is going to get that support. So, just for the sake of your information, this exposure in the proper sense will never happen without the hukumat and the government. When Imam becomes maqsutul yad, how we call it in our fiqh, an Imam who has the hukumat is the one who is mabsut al yad. His hands are free to operate. So he can then implement the sharia because he has the support. So Imam al Askari salam, we have very few hadiths, very few narrations about his life history. We don't know much. Like I said earlier, most of his life is in the prison. Who is going to tell us about what happened in the prison? Isn't it right? except some people who were inside the prison. Those who are narrating from inside the prison are the enemies of the Imam. Isn't it right? First of all, the narrations are not authentic. We cannot even rely on every narration, except some, because some became the supporters later on, so we can rely. So, it's a, it's a sad uh, chapter in the history of Islam, that we find that three of our Imams have been treated uh, like that, in a, in a row. Most of his life was under the prison or under surveillance. And his father, Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam, used to hide himself from a huge number of his followers. Only some of his hawas, some of his close shias and companions were provided access by the Imam and the Qid and Hadi to meet him. And Imam al Askari he, his, his muddat of Imamat, like I said in the beginning of my speech, is only six years. And just six years of Imamat. So in the six years of Imamat, he used to he used to meet with even the khawas. Even uh, the close companions, he used to meet with them from behind the curtain. That's narrated in our own history. Maybe one of the reasons our scholars say is that's how our Imams have been 
training the people to be prepared for the time of Hebat. And yeah, so so it has been narrated that Hassan bin Sabih says, I was in the prison and Imam al-Askari was brought in the same prison. So he says that uh, Imam said to me that you're going to live for 65 years and he mentioned exact duration, this many years and this many days, exact amount of, of time for my life. And uh, then Imam asked me, do you have a son? And I said, no. So Imam prayed for me uh, and said, uh, Oh my Lord, give him a son who is a supporter. So I asked the Imam that, uh, Do you have a son? And he said, I swear to Allah, soon Allah is going to give me a son uh, who is going to fill up the earth with justice, with adl and test. This has been widely narrated in long list of narrations from the Prophet Yamna al-Adwa Qistan wa Adlan and from the Sufi sources and Shia sources alike. So this was widely known even by the enemies, isn't it right? Because this hadith was widely narrated, it was a it was a public information. Even the enemies, Banu Abbas knew that Imam Mahdi al Islam is going to establish a hukumat. Isn't it right? So finally a time will arrive that the nonsense of but Abbas and Banu Umayyah and the Tawuds will end. No one can mess up with the Hukum. Earth is created by Allah and the waris and inheritor has to be his Khalifa. Period. That's the law of Allah. The humans separated religion from politics. Isn't it right? But finally a time will arrive that this nonsense behavior you know, subjecting the 11 Imams to the hardships and troubles and allowing the agenda of Tawuds to prosper, this kind of, you know, uh, evil behavior of the followers and the Muslims is about to come to an end. So, uh, so, so Imam al Islam is going to install the government. We find in the in the Zindan, in the in the jail called Nahrir, Imam Askari was transferred to that jail. That's another jail. And from Banu Abbas, they have commanded the guardian of the jail to be as hard and strict as he can over the Imam. And, and the wife of this guardian said to him that, you know, she basically warned him from doing this behavior uh, towards uh, the Imam alayhi salam. But this guy was definitely an evil person. And uh, he, he said, well, what I'm going to do is that I will throw the Imam into the, into the place where uh, the wild animals have been kept. And uh, so and that's exactly what he did. He put the Imam in that segment of the prison where they have kept the wild animals and beasts. And uh, Imam Askari alayhi salam, the narration says, he was doing his salat and prayers inside that, uh, that area. And all those white and wild animals who were present, they all came and surrounded the Imam in his respect, and all were circling around the Imam and was paying their respects to the Imam. So this is what we say in the dua of the hour number eleven, eleventh hour of the day. 
this dua belongs to Imam al-Asqal al-Islam. This is what we say in the dua. Uh, so we seek uh, towards Allah wa bil Imam al-Hasan ibn Ali alayhi wa salam alayhi salam alladhi turha lis-siba. For the sake of Imam al-Hasan ibn Ali alayhi salam who has been thrown to the wild animals فَخَلَّصْتَهُ فِي مَرَابِضَهَا So you uh, set him free from their place. وَمْتُحِنَا بِالدَّوَابِ بِالسَّعَابِ And he was tested through untamable animals. فَزَلَّلْتَ لَهُ مَرَاكِبَهَا And you uh, caused those animals to become, uh, you know, uh, Tame or uh, modest in front of the Imam for the riding. This is referring to the story when Musta'in bin what he did is that he had a mule and uh, it was uh, wild, not red, allowing anyone to ride over him. So he finally asked the Imam to to help him out to put some the reins and the saddle over this animal. The real purpose of him was not to tame the animal. The real purpose was to kill the animal. Because obviously this kind of horse, this kind of mule, if you are trying to ride, obviously you will end up being thrown several times over the ground and you're talking about definitely, you know, killing of the person or injury of the person, severe injuries. So he wanted to kill the Imam basically, but uh, the narration says the Imam salam, put his hand over the animal. Uh, just like if you remember the story in the, in the night before Ashura, Imam salam, uh, goes, Imam Hussain salam, goes into the khayma of one of his ashab who was in very high fever. And uh, as soon as Imam Hussain enters for the Iyadat, uh, this is Mustahab to pay, uh, do Iyadat and pay a visit to the sick person, a woman who's sick. So Imam Hussain did all the Mustahab uh, you know, in his life, throughout the end of the life. So he says that I was burning in the fever, but as soon as you entered, everything is gone. And Imam Hussain had said to him that Imam Shaykhin illa wa amarahullahu fi ta'ati lana There isn't anything except that Allah has commanded that thing to be obedient for, to us. So every thing of the universe Allah has commanded. This This hadith is another delib for the walayat al-takwiniyya al-mutlaqa for the Ahlul Bayt salam that every think of the universe has been commanded by Allah to to obey them. So animals are no different, they are all obedient. So he oh, as well put his hand over the animal and he started to sweat and show his uh, modesty in front of the Imam and he put the uh, you know saddle and the rein over the animal uh, easily. Please say salawat. In the time of Imam al Askari salam also was the incident of Ishaq al Kindi. Ishaq al Kindi was a philosoph, a philosopher in Iraq, and uh, what he did is that he wrote a book uh, called Tanakhud al Quran the contradictions of Qur'an. So, uh, this is definitely a sign of the inhiraf, uh, a person who is misguided. So, uh, Imam salam is the waris and inheritor of Qur'an. How can he tolerate this kind of thing to happen? So, uh, Ibn Shahar Ashob has written in his book, Manaqib, the Imam said to one of his persons that uh, isn't there anyone among you who can uh, who can ask this person to to change his mind 
or turn away from what he's trying to do. In other words, so he said, well, we, we are unable to stop him. Imam alayhi salam says that if I teach you something, will you convey it to him? He said, yes. So the Imam asked him to uh, basically to go there and uh, get close to that person, have uns, familiarity with that person. And then after that, say to him that uh, if a mutakallim with Quran says to you that is there a chance that Allah have, may have intended some other meaning from those words that you have, you are taking, you are having your dhan and guman and your thoughts that this word means this, is there a chance that Allah has intended some other meaning from that? This is how the Arabic language is, you know, it has so many meanings. One word has 70 meanings, you know, one word has more than 100 meanings, one word one has 120 meanings. That's the way the Arabic language is. It's, it's not easy for a person to understand every intended meaning, so we have to look at the qara'in, qara'in and the external indicators and internal Internal means in the text, included in the text. External means things which are not included in the text of the person. Internal and external indicators and the siyakul kalam, sabakul kalam, and finally uh, the, uh, the uh, ulum, the sciences related to the lughat uh, and uh, you know, the balagat of the kalam and finally we come to a decision. So that's not an easy thing. It takes a lot of research to discover the intended meanings, the meanings that have been intended by the mutakallim. And especially when a mutakallim is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not an easy job. Um, so this person went to Iraq, he traveled to Iraq, met with the person and after a while uh, he said to him, the same thing that Imam said. Is there a chance that, you know, uh, uh, I, the meaning that you are deriving is not the intended meaning of Allah? And he said, well, who taught you this? He said, uh, this has been taught by Imam al-Hassan al-Askari alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. He replied that this thing cannot come from anyone other than the Ahmad Bayt And he burnt down the book that he has composed. He just burnt down the book. The Quran doesn't have any tanaqud or contradiction. The things that seems to be contradictory to the ignorant minds who are not having deeper information about the Quran what seems to be contradictory is not at all contradictory. It's, it requires the knowledge of, of uh, what we call the umum and khusus and mutlaq and muqayyid. Isn't it right? Mujmal and muqayyid and aam and khas. So, uh, also it is narrated uh, from Ali bin Asim and Kufi that uh, I came to see the Imam alayhi salam and he showed me a rug a rug which was from the Mawaris al-Anbiya things, you know, there are several blessed items that every Imam has from the previous prophets this is one of those so Imam showed him that rug which um, had Several of the prophets and messengers of Allah have been sitting on that rug. And Imam alayhi salam showed me the signs of the feet of various prophets on that rug. I started to kiss that rug and I kissed the hand of the Imam. And after that, he says, uh, Ali ibn Asim says, I said to the Imam that, you know, I'm unable to help you at the bed. Obviously, the people are seeing what situation the Ahl Bayt are going through and how they are abandoned and isolated. He says that I am unable to help you 
but in my heart I do the baraat from your enemies and uh, in the loneliness and uh, I have the muwalat and love towards you. So what would be my future? On the day of judgment, what would be my status? Uh, you are seeing the Imam is going through this kind of problem and you are not ready, able to help him. Well, if you are able to help obviously then there is no excuse for a person in that case. But the question was and the situation was he was unable to help. So Imam alayhi salam replies back to him that I heard uh, from my father, in other words, from my grandfather, and from so on, from Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That whoever is da'if and weak from helping us, Ahlul Bayt, and in his loneliness he sends is lot over our enemies and uh, uh, so Allah um, his angels of uh, his voice reaches all the angels and uh, when one of you said the lot on our enemies uh, angels of Allah take that lot and uh, they also send the lanat on the one who doesn't send the lanat. So they send it. So and and also they start they do the istighfar for that person and praise that person. Allahumma salli. They say to Allah, salli ala ruhi abdika hada. Send your salat on the soul of this servant of yours. الذي بذل في نصرة أوليائه جهده. The one who did his effort, whatever effort was in his reach, the one who did his effort for the nusrat and the help of of uh, the awliya and beloved servants of Allah. ولو قدر على أكثر من هذا من ذلك لفعل. We had the is the da'at, the capability to do more than this much help, he would have done, and he could not. Some menin are da'if or mustadaf, right? Weakened people. The highest level of iman is that a person performs the amr bil ma'roof in the munkar with his yad. Yad is a kinaya. Hand is a kinaya, means with our actions. And the second level of Iman is that you do the Amr al munkar against the enemies of Ahlul Bayt with your lisan. You can't do it with your actions, at least you can say. And the third and the lowest level is that you do it in your qalb. You cannot say it or you are weak. Isn't it right? You are covered. You cannot say that much. Or you don't have you see, if you are unable to say it, that's a different thing. That doesn't mean you are a coward, that you are unable to. But if you are able to say and you are not ready to say it, then you are a coward. So if you are, un if you are not ready to say it and you are able to say it, but you are not ready to say it, then the minimum you are required is to have the uh, the inkar ul munkar that means denouncing the wrong and the evil in your qalb and supporting the ma'roof, the good in your qalb. This is the minimum you are required to do if you are a coward. If you don't even do that, then even in the heart you don't feel bad against the enemies. Or in the heart you are not supporting the awliya Allah and the bed and the supporters of and bed. Then this person is no longer a woman if you don't support in your heart. But if the, as a minimum you support in your heart, then you are called a person having other of iman, the weakest of the iman that you're having in the heart only. So the angels do this to our 
who was Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies to his angels, Oh my angels, I accepted your dua. Uh, and um, I accepted your dua and, uh, about this servant. And uh, I heard your voice and I said uh, salat, salawat over my, in other words, my salawat over his soul. And I will include, I include his soul along with those who are the chosen servants of Allah. We are discussing about the scenario when a person is unable to support. Then he will have at least this level of iman in the qalb because he's unable to do the higher levels. We're not talking about the case where the person is able to support but he's a coward. We're not talking about that. Abu Hashim al Ja'fari is one of the very famous companions narrated several narrations from Imam al Hadi and Imam al Askari for both. A very poor person. Imams have been guiding their job is hidayat and guidance. So Imam said to Abu Hashim al Ja'fari that among the sins that are not forgiven is that a person says, La ya laytani lam akhad illa bi hada. In other words, so, and this is a, a very common situation. You know, a lot of people go through this kind of uh, thinking. They, in their mind, they separate their sins. Well, this sin is a smaller one. It's not a big deal. This one is also a small sin. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Allah will forgive it. So in our mind, we keep on. You know, uh, putting our sins on on our corner in our mind and consider it in our mind, we consider it to be not a big deal, except maybe one or few sins that we think, well, this much, yeah, this was a big one. Other than that, everything else, I wish I was not held accountable for anything other than just these two because these are all small ones. If this kind of behavior is something that Imam Ali Salam said, that among the sins which are not forgiven are these. So Abu Hashim al Jafari said, thought in his mind, this is what I also did. I did the same thing in my mind. That means I also separated, you know, some of the, my sins. I consider that this one was big, but you know, as compared to um, other possible sins. So I thought about this in the mind and Imam said, do according to what you thought. In other words, that means what you thought is the right thing to hold yourself accountable about that. And uh, so uh, the hadith says, he, and Imam Islam said that shirk is more hidden than the movement of an uh, ant, of an ant over a black stone in, uh, in, in the black night, in the dark night. Just you imagine if there's a dark night where there's no light and the stone color is also black. An ant, obviously an ant is also black. If it is moving in the dark night with no light on a black stone and the ant itself is also black, how difficult it would be for a person to see the ant and its movement. Imam Ali Salam, such a nice example. He said, shirk is more hidden than that. Iyakum wal muhaqqaratim al Keep away from those things that are considered to be less important. So we consider some of the sins to be less important. It's okay to do. They are less important. That's why we keep on doing it. Because we give less importance to those things. Isn't it? They become malaka. In the negative sense, they become malaka to nafsaniya. They become part of our soul. And we will take those things with us in the grave if we die without the tawbah. Iyakum wal muhakkarat. Keep away from those things which are considered to be haqeel and less important. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said in his hadith that Iblis became radi and pleased about you people regarding muhaqqarat. 
since that you consider big, obviously when you consider big, you will take care of you do the toba. Isn't it right? So the way the nature of the human is. But a sin that I consider to be less important, I will ignore it because I I consider it to be hakir, a very less important thing. Prophet said the hakir, the hakkal, the the sins that we give less importance, if this is radhi about you people regarding those things, those sins. So that one is that those sins are enough for if this to mislead us, basically. And uh, Prophet ﷺ had said to Ibn Mas'ud in his Masih that don't consider your, that don't consider the sin to be haqeeb, less important, and keep away from the kaba'il. On the Day of Judgment, you know, when a person would look at his sins, he will cry blood and filth from his eyes. Blood and filth will come out of his eyes when he will look at his sins. Yawma tajidu and then Prophet recited this ayat of Quran. Yawma tajidu kullu nafsim ma amilat min khayrin muhta. The day when every soul will see what, they, what he did, what he did of the good present. That means all our good deeds, we will watch and see our good deeds in the form of surah, present, physically present in front of us, in the form of a shape and form, uh, you know, present in front of us, whatever, physical or whatever, surah, a form of a, uh, you know, in, in a form and shape. وَمَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ سُوءٍ And what he did of bad, تَوَدُّوا لَوْ أَنَّ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَهُ أَمَدًا بَعِيدًا What he did wrong, he would wish, I wish between that sin, that wrong and myself is a long duration. He doesn't want to even have a look at that, you know. Uh, so we learn that a person does not even like to have a look at his own sins. Uh, and Prophet had also said to Abu Dhar that a moment sees his sin as if a big stone is about to fall over him. Just imagine if you are present in somewhere in the mountain and there are falling rocks. The rocks keep on falling, isn't it right? So if there is a huge stone about to fall over your head, what would you do? Would you stay there? You will run away as soon as you, as fast as you can, you will run away from under that big stone and from the track and the path of that big stone. Look at the example that Prophet is giving to Abu Dhar. A mu'min considers his sin to be such as if he's, that, such that he's standing under a big stone which is about to fall over him. A kafir considers the sin to be like a fly. A fly that passes by over his nose. How much importance you give to that? This came and passed, passed by and went away. And you forgot it. And just busy in business as usual after a few moments. Isn't that right? This is how a kafir looks at the sins. So, Ashaddu Zunub Mastahana Dihi Sahibuhu. The most severe of the sins is what. Uh, you know, the sinner considers it to be lowly. This sin is less, it's not a big deal. So, uh, so this is how it gradually it uh, piles up like there's a story in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam that uh, he went narrated by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam that Prophet was in a place in a so we learn in the light of that narration, it was in a Sahara, in a desert, without any plantation, without any uh, plants, barren desert. And Prophet asked his uh, Ashab, Ituni Bihatami, bring me the firewood. 
Because half set to Rasulullah is a barren desert. Uh, you cannot bring a wood in a barren desert. There's no plant growing there. They went, everybody went in some direction to find something, you know, something to the Prophet. After a while, everyone, when they returned back, they brought little by little, everyone gathered certain small things and they all piled up into a huge pile from a barren desert. When the huge pile was made by the Ashab, that's where the Prophet said, everything of the Prophet has hikmat and wisdom. So that's where the Rasulullah said, Hakaza, Hakaza tastama'uzzunub. That's how the sins gather. Gradually we did five harams, three harams today, five harams tomorrow, and we consider it to be less important, didn't even do tawbah, just pass by. Next day we did another six haram, another two haram, but hasad towards the mu'min, then tohmat to somebody, is that right? Doing so many other harams, and it keeps on piling up without tawbah, without tawbah, keep on piling up. Some of the sins we don't even realize that it's a sin. We keep on doing it. Or uj, khud pasandi, then right, we consider, no, I, I am okay, there's nothing wrong with me. Everyone else can be wrong, but I am okay. I'm not ready to pay, pay attention to my own faults. Get slowly and gradually, the sins are all piling up over the back of the person. So, and these sins then, at the time of death, convert into the chains. Ahlal and Salasil. Ahlal and Salasil are the same. Ahlal and Salasil are uh, uh, the chains which actually are the sins that convert into, uh, that become visible in the form of chains. So, uh, so before I come to the end of my speech, uh, the hadith of the Imam alayhi salam, which is narrated from Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, we have very few hadiths anyways, but one of the hadiths for the sake of tayammun and tabarruq, I would like to mention his hadith where he said, La tumare fayadhab bahaaka. Don't do mira, otherwise your baha and value will be lost. This is how it happens if you can. Mira and Jidal, we already discussed in our lessons, if you, you know, if you remember, I talked about for quite, uh, quite, uh, you know, a lot of uh, things and uh, hadiths have been mentioned about Jidal and Mira. You, know, you, you prove your point with your Dalil and Burhan and the person accepts it, fine. Doesn't accept, you don't keep on insisting. You don't keep on arguing. Arguing for the sake of argument after you have already made your point is useless and condemned in Islam. We don't spend our, our time in arguing after we have proven our point with the delete. We don't waste our time. This, if you keep on wasting your time in the argument, this is called jidal. That is condemned in al akhlaq This is going to lose the value of your personality. Wala tumazih and don't uh, uh, joke around, don't joke for yujtara alayka. People will start, become courageous against you. This is, this is very, very true because if you start joking with people, you know, uh, who you don't have this kind of relation with them, isn't it right? And they will definitely, uh, they may end up saying things against you which you don't like. So how we can stop that? We don't enter into uh, this kind of joking uh, conversation with them. And he also says in another hadith that قَلْبُ ahmaq fi famihi. The, the heart of a silly, a stupid person is in his mouth. That means he says all what he thinks in the heart. He just says it. Isn't that right? 
وَفَمُرْ حَكِيمٌ فِي قَلْبِهِ And the mouth of the wise person is in his heart. It means he thinks. He doesn't keep end up saying whatever he wants. He thinks, you know. And this is how we are supposed to do. The tuhaddis, like we in Islam has said, the tuhaddis, بِمَا لَا تَعْلَمْ Don't speak about what you don't know. And then Imam Ali says, لَا تُحَدِّسْ بِكُلِّ مَا تَعْلَمْ And don't speak about all that you know. Everything that you know is not supposed to be told to the other, right? You pick and choose, you, you tell some of the things that you know. Why you are choosing some of the things? Because you find which person deserves to be told. Isn't it right? We talk to people according to their mental levels. So Imam Al-Asqari is salam that he is poisoned by Muqtamid Billah according to Sheikh Saduq's narration and we find that Abu Sahl um, Ishaq Al-Nawbakhti Rahmatullah Alayhi is a very great companion of Imam Al-Asqari Ishaq Al-Nawbakhti he was, he was present in the final moments of Imam al-Asqari In the final moments, this companion was present in that, that precious time. And, uh, and he says that I saw Imam al-Mahdi who was a young baby, young boy, five and a half years old approximately. Very, very few people saw him. Just, I just mentioned to you minutes ago that Imam al-Asqari used to meet with his khawas, his close companions from behind the curtain. So there are very, very, very few people who had the opportunity to meet with Imam Sahib Zaman al Islam. And these people are really awliyaullah, very great personalities. So he says that I was there with the Imam and his final moment and he was on his in the deathbed. He was already poisoned. He was in the deathbed and uh, he asked his son to be brought from inside. His son was doing the sajda and he was called by the servant. And when his son came, his son, Imam asked his son to give him water. And the son grabbed the glass and gave the water to his father. And I saw that, and then Imam Al-Hassan, Imam Al-Hujjat and Al-Hassan Al-Hassan helped his father to do the wudu, and Imam did his final two rakats of prayers before the shahada. And uh, and after his salat, he introduces the Imam. He talks about. Imam al-Mahdi salam that he is the Mahdi and he is, you know, the one who is, uh, uh, you know, uh, who is going to be, in other words, he is the, he's the Imam. And uh, when the Shahadat happens and his uncle, Jafar, comes out to lead the Janazah, it is not allowed for anyone other than the Ma'soom to do the Ghusl or the Tahneet or the Takfeen or the Tadfeen or the Salatul Mayyit for the Ma'soom. Only a Ma'soom can do that. And the people saw at that occasion, those people who were present there in the Jama'at, they saw that a child five and a half years old approximately, came out of the house and removed his uncle Jafar away and he led the jamaat over Imam al-Asqari This is how the situation happens. So at the time of the shahadat of the Imam, at least we find that Imam al-Mahdi is present. He is providing water to the Imam. He is helping the Imam for doing the wudu. Isn't it right? But at the time in Karbala, 
we find it's exactly the opposite. There is no one present next to Imam al Hussein al Islam. Imam Hussein is left alone, completely alone. Gharibah, Wahidah, Faridah, completely alone and lonely. There is none of Banu Hashim present next to the Imam, and there is none of the Ashab present next to the Imam. And Imam alayhi salam, when he comes to the Khaybah to seek his vida and do farewell towards his sister, his sister says that, have you prepared yourself to get, to get killed? And Imam replies back, why wouldn't a person prepare who has no hami and no nasir and no supporter remaining? So Imam al Islam is completely lonely. And Imam al Islam, when he starts to fight against the enemy, he says, See the battle of the thirsty person. See the battle of the hungry person. When Imam Sahib Zaman would appear, he would enter the Holy Kaaba. He would also say, Allah ya ahl al-alam, inna jaddi al-Husayn qataluhu atshana. Oh, the people of the world, my grandfather Hussein, they killed him thirsty. So Imam Hussein al-Islam, there was no one to provide water to him. And in the final moments also some narration say, the Imam asked Shimr al to provide water. And he refuses. Obviously, even if Shimr had given the water to the Imam, the Imam would never drink the water because Abu Fadl Abbas died thirsty, because Sakina is there thirsty, because Zainab salam is thirsty. Why would Imam drink the water? But he was never given the water. And until the last moments of his life, he was never given the water. And we find finally when the water comes, after the Asr of Ashura, after the Shahada of the Imam, when the water is brought and it is said that the one who is the youngest will get the water first. And then the water is given to Sakina bint al Hussein. She receives the water and she starts walking towards the Maktal. When Sayyidah Zainab asks her, where are you going? She says, you said that the youngest should get the water first. I am taking the water to Ali al Asghar. He is younger than me.